Laudator Jesus Christus in Secula. Welcome to the Guild Family stream, everybody. Nice to see y'all. Welcome. If you're new to the Guild Family stream, this the format for this is a, a totally open conversation. I'm going to give a presentation, but during that, if y'all want to chat in at any time, comments, questions, we'll just, it's just a conversation, basically. Um, the format right now, what we're going to do to try to raise money for the apostolate is that we're going to do, um, I'm going to focus more on providing high quality guild member content for y'all uh, as part of the guild that supports the lay apostolate. And then what we'll do is we'll release the first five, 10, 15 minutes of each one of these shows publicly. And just to offer this to people and invite them to uh, join the guild. As always, if you can't afford $5 a month, $10 a month or whatever, if you still want access to the guild or the apostolate, you can always join for free. Uh, just go to meaningofcatholic.com slash contact. Send me a message and we can get you free membership if you can't afford it. So thank you, guild members, for your support of our family apostolate. Your support helps the Flanders family with income. It also helps us expand. It uh, helps all of our contributors, volunteers, and contractual employees, as it were. Um, and we're hoping to expand this, God willing, if God would allow it and will it. So uh, this this is a series called St. John Paul II and St. Marcel the Moderate, question mark. And this is far too controversial for uh, public viewing uh, for reasons we'll discuss. And um, so, uh, yeah, welcome to uh, Nick, Robert, Alex, Arathelion. If you're new, please tell me where you're at. I, I love hearing from people as to where you are in the world. Um, most of our viewership is in North America, but we also have some Europeans. We've got some Aussies. Um, we've got some South Americans. Um, so uh, let's get into our topic. Here's what we're going to cover on this series. Is uh, We're going to cover... So St. John Paul II and St. Marcel the Moderate. Here's what we're going to cover. One number, one, number one, the principles of Christian judgment. How do we judge these things uh, with truth and charity? These are difficult matters, and we're going to talk about some essential principles of judging as Christians. And then we'll talk about the essential texts. If you haven't read these, uh, it's hard for anyone to take you seriously on this particular topic, honestly. And this is a, this is a situation that unfortunately we're dealing with. Um, number three is that I'm not a pious and of either man. In fact, I will, during this series, I will provide the, the best possible sympathetic portrait of each man. And I will, in terms of praising all of their good qualities and good things that they've done. And I will also provide as much as I can possibly do an, a fair critique of their words and actions. I have great, lots of good things to say about both both men um, and lots of, not lots, but some critiques of both men. Um, I, I certainly love St. John Paul II. Um, I've taken heat from trads because I venerate John Paul II as a saint. Um, but I've also taken heat from you know, the other side of things, because I, I would still consider Archbishop Lefebvre to be a great man. He certainly seems to be uh, a pious man of God trying to do his best. Doesn't mean he did everything right. Uh, but also, even as John, uh, you know, St. John Paul II, you know, St. John, saints are also not infallible or impeccable in all of their actions. So, um, you know, just because someone is canonized, it does not mean that everything they did was the right thing to do either. Um, so we'll try to talk about all that. Um, uh, we're going to talk about the excommunication of Marshall Lefebvre. We'll talk about the Holy See and the SSPX, the sort of the history there. Um, I think that something I have to say on the outside is that I'm not an apologist for the SSPX. Um, but I mean, the bottom line is that I, it seems to me that the reason we're doing these two figures together is because it seems to me that both of these figures have been tarred and feathered unjustly by the sort of the other side of things. But on the other hand, I think there can sometimes be an excess on the other side of the, the coin too. 
one can venerate one of these men sort of too excessively, if you will, to the point they're, you know, they are basically impeccable uh, because an impeccable saint doesn't even exist. You know, even if a saint, even if someone is a saint. Um, but the fact is that followers of Lefebvre, many of the followers of Lefebvre uh, do venerate him as a saint, as as the followers of John, Joan of Arc did, uh, who was excommunicated and never vindicated for centuries. Um, and um, I, I want to try to carve out a middle ground here where the followers of Lefebvre and the followers of John Paul II can try to see a more moderate view of the other side, the other man on the other side of that aisle, basically. And this is obviously right in line with our, our mission at Meaning of Catholic, which is to unite Catholics against the enemies of Holy Church. And so I am trying to fulfill this mission uh, by making this presentation. Um, so we'll just talk about some of that. Um, so the, yeah, the excommunication of uh, Marcel Lefebvre, Holy See and SSPX, um, what I would consider an anti-Lefebvre neo-Jansenism within the SSPX, um, which seems to be problematic, um, but it doesn't seem to be in line with what Marcel Lefebvre intended, as far as I can tell. Um, we'll also look at Joseph Ratzinger's comments about Marcel Lefebvre. Um, then we'll talk about canonizations, canonization of John Paul II, or canonization is infallible, papal bureaucracy. We'll also look at Athanasius Snyder's comments on John Paul II. We'll look at Gary Goulagrange and John Paul II. Those are areas that will really challenge trads, I think. Um, also, post-partition Poland. This history of Poland is, in my view, the key to understanding John Paul II and uh, his pontificate, uh, his his. His, um, his priesthood before his pontificate and his pontificate. If you understand post-partition Poland, I think you will understand and appreciate the greatness of Karol Wojtyla, how, how really, what a great man of God he really was in the 20th century. And you'll also be able to understand, I think, uh, where he may have had weak points and blind spots where he may have not understood some certain things about certain thing went on. Um, a, per, a good example of this is um, the fact that in communist Poland, the way that you brought down your enemies in communist Poland is that you slandered them. So in communist Poland, you would you would just make up a charge against somebody and you'd say, oh, this guy did such and such. And then the communists, you know, that's how communists work. They just make up, a, they have a show trial and they, you know, take people out. So this helps us to understand, for example, why did Paul, John Paul II not give greater credence to the accusations against various corrupt people in his pontificate well it makes total sense because that's 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 you know his operating that's the way the communist would kill people you know take people out was to slander them so he, he was just sort of taking all of these accusations with a big grain of salt as he would as he had been doing for decades under the communist polls so that's an example of what helps us understand why did John Paul II not crack down on the corruption more than he 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 may have he could have as as Ratzinger did later as as Benedict XVI? Okay, um, number fourteen, very important thing is that John Paul II was not an existentialist or a phenomenologist, and we'll talk about his dissertation under Shaler, the person in that co translation controversy. If anyone tells you that John Paul II was a phenomenologist or that he was an existentialist, they don't understand John Paul II, and you can just move on. And so this, unfortunately, this is, this is something that's a, a common misconception about John Paul II. And so this is where, uh, you know, the, I mean, the bottom line is that if trads or, or Lefebvreists, if they want us to take a sympathetic view toward Archbishop Lefebvre and appreciate him, they have to be fair and give the same benefit of the doubt to John Paul II. And if John Paul II people want us to appreciate St. John Paul II, they have to be willing to also take a fair view of Archbishop Lefebvre. There has to be a consistent, fair principle of judgment, which we'll get into. Uh, number 15, the illicit and disobedient ordinations by Archbishop uh, Carol Wojtyla, later John Paul II, a uh, very important uh, point of history that's not very much been discussed, uh, because John Paul II, or as, as Archbishop Le uh, uh, Archbishop of uh, Cardinal of Krakow, Wojtyla, he did a, a similar action as Archbishop Lefebvre did later in 1988. Not the same, but there are similarities. And then, as I said, 
any questions throughout the whole program, feel free to chat them in um, and uh, let me know anything y'all want to talk about. So let's get started. Um, okay. <laughs> I was just talking to a, a very well-established and excellent Thomist, an expert on Gary Gula Grange, uh, for number 12. So I, I'll, I'll, he was just texting me. I was trying to finish this right before the, uh, the, the broadcast began here. So, okay. So let's get into some of the subject here. So this is still going to be public. We're going to go through some of this stuff. Um, and then we'll go through, um, introduction to the essential texts, and then we'll stop the public part of this. Okay. So this is the principle of charity. You may have heard me um, mention this before, but this is from Summa Theologiae, Secunda Secundae, question 60, article four, where he says, uh, doubts should be interpreted in the best sense. So here's St. Thomas. This is the principle of charity and principle of charitable judgment. No man ought to be despised in any way, injure another man without urgent cause. And consequently, unless we have evident indications of a person's wickedness, we ought to deem him good by interpreting for the best whatever is doubtful of him. And this is the real kicker right here. St. Thomas says, he who interprets doubtful matters for the best may happen to be deceived more often than not. Yet it is better to err frequently through thinking well of a wicked man than to err less frequently through having an evil opinion of a good man, because in the latter case, an injury is inflicted, but not in the former. So this is a very, very important principle of judging with charity because ultimately everybody, I mean, everybody um, deserves a sympathetic reading, a sympathetic view towards them. Um, as St. James says in the epistle for today's feast, he says, he says, um, judgment without mercy towards him who has not shown mercy. Our Lord says, he who is blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And so, and he said, and Jesus says, judge not lest ye be judged. The method that you meet out will be meted to you. So if you want to judge your brother, whoever he may be, with an immense strictness, harshness, that there's the parable of the unmerciful servant. The, the parable of the unmerciful servant is, is the most uh, conspicuous, conspicuous example of this, where you have the Lord forgives it's impossible debt that's, you know, would have taken three lifetimes to pay off. He forgives this immense debt. And then that servant goes off and chokes his fellow servant who ends up, owes him like $10. And Jesus is showing this conspicuous example of the way that we judge other people. So when we are judging Lefebvre or John Paul II, in terms of, we do have to make a judgment. We, we can't refrain from making any sort of judgment because we have to interact with other persons. We have to make a judgment. You know, can I trust this person? That's really the question. Can I trust this person? You know, am I going to allow this person to teach me and give him authority over me? Now, we'll talk about other aspects of that in just a minute. But if you are going to presume to give this immensely strict judgment to your, your brother, well, God will mete out that same strict judgment to you. As that what happened in the parable of the unjust, the unmerciful servant is that the Lord then condemned that unmerciful servant until he should pay the debt, which means he would be in, you know, condemned to eternal punishment. And so we should fear, we should have fear and trembling when we approach these topics. You know, we should not, and, and this is, this is the basic um, sort of the autobiographical, autobiographical side of this for me is because as an Eastern Orthodox, I was convinced of Eastern Orthodoxy and um, it, 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 it requires an immense amount of study and understanding of the other side of things to really get past the um, the very convincing Eastern Orthodox apologetics. The only way to do that is to understand Catholicism in the way that Catholics understand it, not in the way that Eastern Orthodox understand it. And the same is true if you're a Protestant convert, and the same was true for me too. You know, as a Protestant, I was understanding Catholicism the way that Protestants understand it. So therefore, I misunderstood it. So everybody deserves a sympathetic understanding. We need to understand other people the way that they understand themselves. And because otherwise, we will be judged more strictly by God. So it, we should have this fear and trembling. This is what I attempted to do in my book, City of God, 
was try to give everybody in history a most sympathetic reading possible. Unless, says St. Thomas, unless we have evident, we have evident indications of a person's wickedness. You know, because there comes a point where we we do have to say, well, obviously that person's wicked now. I, I hate to say it, but my reason must conclude that we have evidence. And the, the example I usually bring up is Archbishop um, Bunini, Anibali Bunini. We have uh, very strong evidence that we have s- strong circumstantial evidence that he was a Freemason. We have strong firsthand accounts that he was lying and, and cheating his way through all this manipulation of the liturgy. So we have evident indications of his wickedness. So we we reasonably, we can reasonably say that he was of ill intent. He may have been a Freemason. We're not sure exactly, but um, these things are quite evident at this point. So it's, it's hard for us to still give him the benefit of the doubt. I would argue that, I mean, all of the critiques that I've ever seen of John Paul II and Archbishop Lefebvre don't really get past the surface level, as far as I can tell. They're they're throwing out these misconceptions and caricatures that I don't even, and it, just these basic things like saying John Paul II was a phenomenologist. That's a basic thing. If you don't understand that he's not a phenomenologist, I, I mean, I'm just going to toss out the rest of whatever you want to say about John Paul II, because you don't understand some of the basics of who he is and what he taught, you know. Um in the same way, you know, if you call Archbishop Lefebvre and you just think he's like this raging schismatic who like wanted to, you know, he was basically Martin Luther. He wanted to like create, you know, um, you know, lead this this revolt like Martin Luther did. You really don't understand Mar- Archbishop Lefebvre. You've never really read any of his writings or his biography. I mean, we're just not going to take you seriously, you know. And this is this is the this is the what we need to do to approach these things and apply these things. There's two other citations I want to bring up, <clears throat> and then we'll talk about um, the essential text. And that's from uh, Saint John Cassian. These books I always recommend to people. Um, these are the foundations of Western spirituality. These are the books that Saint Benedict read and wrote his Benedictine rule. These are um, Saint Dominic carried this book on his person at all times the conferences. Um, so this is St. John Cassian, the institutes and St. John Cassian, the conferences. This is where we get the idea of the seven deadly sins It's from the institutes. So this is, this, these are the books from the three hundreds, um, the foundations of Western spirituality. Um, and, um, so if you ever, uh, pick these up, these will just knock your teeth out. Just a very, very powerful spiritual reading. So I'm going to read two citations from these two books uh, on the principles of Catholic judgment. Um, Let me see. Okay, so here's from the Institutes. He says this. It is dangerous to judge others because being unaware of the need or the motive out of which they do things offensive to us, but either correct or excusable in God's sight. We put ourselves in the position of having judged them rashly. In this, we commit no small sin by thinking of our brothers other than we ought. Which is is very much saying the same thing as uh, St. Thomas says later. But it it is a sin. It's a sin to judge rashly because we're, we're injuring our brother's reputation, even in our own mind. And we're endangering our own souls by putting upon ourselves a more strict judgment. Um, And then here's in the conferences, he says this, the knowledge of everything is attained by those who think well and with simplicity about all matters who strive to imitate faithfully rather than to discuss everything that they are being taught or done by the elders. So he's talking about in a monastic context when we're talking about the abbots and the elders doing things. Um, And uh, but whoever begins to learn by discussion will never enter into the reason for the truth because the enemy will see him trusting in his own judgment rather than in that of the fathers and will easily drive him to the point where even things which are very beneficial and salutary will seem useless and harmful to him. The clever foe will so play upon his presumption that stubbornly clinging to his own unreasonable understanding, he will persuade himself that only that is holy, which he considers to be correct and righteous guided by his erroneous obstinacy alone. Um, so, this this shows the the immense danger of pride that is mixed in with a rash judgment. If you have a rash judgment of your brother, the devil sees this and can immediately seize upon this and make you even more obstinate. And 
in my view, I do think that this happens. It seems to, uh, it seems to be, there be, it seems to be a temptation to do this with Lefebvre or John Paul too, because it, I think that we want to have a black and white view of everybody. I think it's, it's just an easier way to, to live. It's an easier way to just say like, this guy's all evil. This guy's all good. And then we can just, uh, we don't have to really be challenged in our thinking. Uh, we don't have to think at all. Um, and um, it, it sort of creates this, uh, this place where we can't have any nuance. We can't have any understanding of sort of the other side. We want to create these party systems. And um, that it was ultimately trusting in our own, our own understanding and in our own um, ability to reason through these things. Now, um, I've got uh, some questions here from guild members. Let me just finish this part out and then we'll get into those questions in, in about two minutes. Um, okay, and we're also going to talk about the ecclesiastical judgment because there has been an ecclesiastical judgment on Lefebvre and John Paul II, namely an excommunication and a an canonization. So that also factors into all these things. So this is all of these principles are, are simply saying this is the basic Christian presumption that you have to have towards everybody. Most especially people who are in the clergy, but most especially um, people who are in the papacy, but also we'll get into the ecclesiastical job in just a minute. So let me just say this, uh, and then we'll close out the public portion of this video. Here's some of the essential texts. So um, if, if you haven't, you know, if people are talking about Archbishop Lefebvre and they haven't read his biography, then they may not know what they're talking about. Um, there's also a three volume set by Michael Davies called Apologia. Uh, it's Apologia for, pro uh, Marcel Lefebvre. Three volume set is that's another essential reading. Here's another essential text open letter to confused Catholics, Mar uh, Marcel Lefebvre. Um, these are some of the basics. And this is what uh, I've really been surprised for me um, reading the biography and how much Marcel Lefebvre really was a moderate. And that's why we're calling him Marcel the Moderate. And that's, that's something that Kennedy Hall uh, deserves credit for. Um, but I've really been surprised by his moderation and not his extreme, you know, the, the caricature of him is that he's such an extreme, rigid, you know, schismatic guy, but he's just so moderate in so many of his approaches. So we'll get into that. Okay, so essential reading for John Paul II. First, the, the, the basic biography in English is written by George uh, Weigel. And so because it's written by George Weigel, unfortunately, uh, you do have to filter out his Americanism because uh, all due respect to George Weigel, uh, he is very much a, a neoconservative Americanist in many ways. So you really have to filter that out in order to understand Wojtyla, in my view. Um, you need to be able to filter that part out of this biography and then insert a more Polish understanding, I think. And we'll talk about that. But it's still essential reading because it, it's just got the 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 you know the basics of everything really it's a very long biography it's 800 pages um but that's essential this this is um this is a much better look i think at Wojtyla. um this is by rocco Bottiglioni. this was written right when john paul ii ascended to the the papacy uh and unlike most commentators on john paul ii Rocco Bottiglioni, he's an Italian, but he learned Polish. And so he was able to read Wojtyla in Polish. Uh, he was a personal friend of Wojtyla. And uh, this work is, is this is where he kind of supplement, Wojt, uh, uh, supplement Weigel so that you can get a much more Polish understanding, Polish Catholic understanding of Wojtyla from Bottiglioni. Um, and then this is, uh, person and act is, um, is, Wojtyla was essential work. That's this is his most important work of philosophy. Uh, the problem is that it's extremely difficult philosophy. I find it very difficult. I and I'm not really good at philosophy in the first place, but I can get some of the basics. But it's extremely difficult philosophy. Um, a much easier read, actually. Um, this is actually a much better read. I forgot to. I forgot to bring this one up, but this one is actually a lot easier. It, you know, if you don't want to try to tackle this huge philosophical philosophical work, the personalism of John Paul II uh, by John F. Crosby. This is a just a really small text, uh, 94, 94 
uh, pages. If you're um, like, especially if you're a trad, if you're a Lefevreist, I would really recommend this book because it's just a really, really easily basic understanding, basic introduction to John Paul II and, and his personalism. Okay, so we're going to close out the, the public portion of this. Uh, we've already, it's, we haven't even scratched the service yet. Uh, but so if you want the full series, you can uh, subscribe, pay. Oh, am I still transmitting? I think I lost my lost my transmission for a minute. But yes, if you can't afford it, feel free to contact me and we'll get you some contact. So let me uh, get to y'all's question. Um, 